we really wanted these teams in particular to be able to connect with the employee community around their projects as they're both centered on things at Olin. The larger perspective on this is that we're, with a new strategic plan, we have impact-centered education as a central focus, and these are two examples of making impact at Olin in one's courses. And so they're interesting to think with both about the particular projects the students are working on, but also in terms of the larger things we're, we're doing at Olin. So I'm super excited. We have the eco class, which Carrie and Claire teach, and lots of other employees engage with the students. Kristen and Susan. And, and Kristen and Susan, and Kelly is going to be the um, speaker. And then we have a team right here, which is from uh, the class Mark and I taught last semester. So uh, we'll do like 20 minutes each. Do you need somebody to tell you about the time, or are you good? I, I, I think I can monitor the time. All right, so I'm going to go this way back over here. Thank you. Okay. So, hello. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend this presentation. I'm really excited to talk to you about all the things that we've been doing in this class. Um, I'm representing the class of ECO. For those of you who don't know, ECO stands for Environmental Consulting at Olin. It's a class that's centered around making positive, sustainable change at Olin through research, collaborating with stakeholders, and also implementing different iterations of our projects to make sure we know exactly what people want the most and figure out how we can implement them. So the pre the, this presentation has three major goals. Um, one, I want to talk to you about why we're doing this project um, and um, what positive outcomes we hope will uh, occur because of it. Also, I want to inform you about the specifics about all the changes that we're going to make and how you all can contribute to it. Um, and also, I want to answer any questions and receive feedback about our project on how we can make it better before we implement the entire thing. Here's a feedback form. Please use it as much or as little as you would like to. Um, it has a few different questions. None of them are required, so you can fill out as much of it or as little of it as you want to. Um, it's just to try and get as much um, feedback and as many opinions as we can about our new waste system. I'll hold it here for a hot sec so people can scan the code. It'll also appear at the end if you okay. want to. If you want to scan it at the end too. Yeah, okay. So, the general plan for um, these changes we're making is we are trying to centralize the waste systems um, in Miles Hall and the Campus Center in order to, prov to, promote, to promote environmental and personal uh, positive changes. Um, so, basically, now your offices, um, if you have office bins in uh, Miles Hall or the Campus Center, they won't be taken out by custodians. You can take your garbage out into um, centralized bins as well as your recycling. Um, let's see, there is an opt-out option specifically for people who have accessibility restrictions uh, that disable them from taking out their own waste. If uh, this applies to you or somebody that you know, you can definitely um, contact HR about it. Um, but we're hoping that as many people as possible implement this new system and take out their um, individual waste bins. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, basically, we hope that um, giving more recycling bins in more centralized locations will help cut down contamination and make it such that more of our recycling can actually be recycled. Um, and also, it'll mean that less um, waste can go to the incinerator, which will cut down on our carbon emissions. Um, yeah, and emissions due to waste production in Miles Hall and the campus center will hopefully uh, decrease substantially given this new sorting system and the new, more diverse options for where to put your waste. See, this is what all of our centralized locations are going to look like. Um, we're going to have a black waste bin, new recycling bins for mixed recycling and cardboard. Um, we're separating out cardboard so that um, the cardboard can be taken to a separate facility where it's worth a little bit more um, for us to give it to them. Um, a yellow e-waste bin and a blue compost bin, a little small one so that it can be taken out every night um, and then rinsed out, and a small orange battery bin. We're trying to keep all of the colors um, uniform throughout both the buildings so that people can just look at the color of the bin and know what goes in it. So, um, as um, as a more detailed description of what your offices will be doing, um, your personal bins won't get taken out by custodians anymore. So you can 
take out your garbage when it gets full. Um, and in order for, to prevent it from smelling after multiple days, you can take out all the organic waste that would produce the stench um, into the compost bins in the centralized locations. Um, so in the past, Custodians have gone into every office every night, taken out the trash, and done like a spot cleaning, a, a quick like wipe down of it, clean areas on your desk and stuff like that. Um, they'll no longer be doing that to save them a little bit of time, um, but they will still deep clean your office at least once a week. If you need uh, your office to be cleaned on a particular night, and you don't know if that night is the night that custodians will be taking out, um, will be cleaning out your office, um, you can always work order and ask, hey, a dog came into my office today, or something like that, and dragged a bunch of mud everywhere or something. So that's always an option. So this is what our current system looks like. We, um, as the eco class, we went through um, all of the garbage bins in Milos after a day or so. And the image on the left is like supposed to be recycling, but you can see some compostable cups are in there that can't be recycled. There's some plastic in there that can't be recycled, and some paper towels and stuff like that. So we're trying to reduce the amount of contamination by improving the bin locations, improving the signage, and improving just the clarity of what should go in the bin. You can see that like a green cans and bottles lid is on a single stream recycling bin, so people can't really tell what's supposed to go in there. It's also green, so we're going to try and make all of our recycling blue and our compost green. And then on the right, you can see a battery bin that looks like a garbage can. It just has a sign on the side that says batteries, and it's got like plastic bags in there. It's got some trash because people just think it's a trash can. So yeah, here are a few more of the positive impacts we're, we're hoping to have based off of this project. Um, we're hoping to in, um, increase proper sorting. Um, we're supposed to, we're hoping that adding compost um, will reduce the number of plastic bags that we need to um, throw away. And also, we're hoping that not going into every office will help custodians dedicate more time to like deep cleaning bathrooms, cleaning out the compost bins that everybody's going to be using, and also doing basic maintenance that they don't have time to do right now. Um, yeah, and also the color-coded very well-marked bins are hopefully going to be pleasing to the eye. And it'll also help convey the message, a message that Olin is trying to send of proper waste sorting, sustainability, and all of that. We're hoping that that will be like a public display of our values. Oh yeah, which of these benefits do you think is most important? Do you like um, the increased signage or Save the custodian's time or the color coding, anything like that. I don't know. Anyway. Um, Reduced incineration. <laughs> Composting. Yeah. You know, the offices, so don't throw my food in the trash. Oh, yeah. The dining hall is so far away, but hopefully now that there will be compost bins on every floor, um, faculty and staff will have more um, close access to composting bins. So, yeah. yeah I like saving the custodian's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, so yeah, composting as a motivator. Um, we are going to help contribute to a larger plan um, statewide to have a more sustainable future. Um, and it'll hopefully help people uh, be more motivated um, to improve their own sustainability practices. Um, and also our compost provider, Saro, um, it helps local farmers, so we can help increase our impact in that regard, too. So this is what Milas Hall currently looks like in terms of trash and recycle bins. Um, you can see that they're very spread around. All of the red ones are trash, and the blue ones are recycling. You can see a couple of battery bins around, um, but a lot of the time, people don't even know that they're there. So we're hoping to make it more accessible and more well known. So now I'm gonna go through all the floor plans in Miles Hall and the Campus Center just to show you vaguely where they are. We'll have these signs up and around so that people know exactly where they can find a battery bin and all of that stuff. So yeah. This is the lower level. Um, there's one in the library in the bottom left corner and there's one um, near the scope rooms so that people in scope can take their garbage out into centralized locations and also people who aren't in scope can still access the bins so that they're not like behind in a locked room. Um, this is the first floor. There's one outside um, the front door. There's one in the area, and there's one 
in the kitchen net in the Office of Financial Aid and Admission. This is the second floor. This is where a lot of the offices are. Um, there's one station in the coffee room that has batteries, e-waste, and recycling because it doesn't make sense to put a compost bin in the coffee room. Um, and then in the kitchenette, in the lower left corner, there is a compost trash and recycling. Because it doesn't make too much sense to put batteries and e-waste in a kitchenette. That's generally how we sort the kitchenettes in the coffee rooms. We have no compost in the coffee rooms and no batteries and e-waste in the kitchenettes. Uh, this is the third floor, very similar to the second floor. Um, except there's no presidential suite, there's just another coffee room and a kitchenette close to each other. Um, yeah, so this is the campus center. The lower level, there's one, there's a battery bin outside the mail room, and um, there's also trash and recycling, so that people who have mail and packaging can dispose of them properly. Um, this is the first floor. We have a trash and recycling outside the dining hall. There's already compost um, associated with the dining hall, so we didn't think we needed another one. This is the second floor. We were advised by the head of facilities that we should have one trash and recycling up in the dining hall beds and one right up here near the boardroom um, so that people who go to the elevators or are in this room can dispose of their waste in a pretty close location. And then this is the third floor. There is a, an e-waste outside of IT so that IT can monitor what's going into it so that People aren't just throwing away old laptops or something like that that IT needs to like dispose of properly. Um, there's also a copy room in the lower left-hand corner where there is paper recycling and cardboard recycling. Uh, they're both blue because they're both recycling. So yeah, we've done a lot of research um, figuring out what people want and how the system can best adhere to people's desires. So. We've done a lot of interviews with people around Miles Hall on the second floor, the lower level, people in the, uh, in the library, people in the Office of Financial Aid. Um, we've also had meetings with custodians, the head of facilities. We had a design review with the students of the MCCI class. Um, and we've taken away a few different things. Some people say that um, they wouldn't be willing to take out their own trash if like it stayed in their office and smelled after a day or two. So we were like, let's put compost there. Um, and then some people are like, well, I can't, um, let's see, I can't read um, the signage that I'm going to show soon. Um, so I want more pictures in it or something like that. So we're trying to take people's advice and figure out how we can best make a project that works for the most part. So yeah, signage. This is, is um, one type of signage that we tested out. It's very image heavy, um, and it shows what you should and shouldn't throw away um, just by looking at the icons. Um, this style we have seen works with some people, but some other people like more specific text, like exactly what they should and shouldn't throw away. So there's this option, and then there's this option, which is very text heavy, like what you should and shouldn't throw away. Um, things that are bolded are um, like more, um, more negative and things that aren't bolded are things that you can throw away method. Um, we do need to choose one method of signage out of these two. So I'm hoping that um, some feedback from this group could help us decide. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the end. I'm Esme. Okay. Um, and this is our project that we did last semester for my communications course um, on change of women. And we did on course valuations. So we had heard like a lot of mixed concerns about course valuations from a ton of different stakeholders. Um, we, I think, all wanted to do a project that kind of got at people's well-being, and we wanted to talk about how community members um, and like how feedback is shared and received among them. Um, and so we wanted to kind of explore and understand the course evaluation system. Um, so in doing this, we interviewed five students, 12 faculty members, and three administrators. Um. Oh, yeah. So um, there were a lot of insights that we got from this process, but to kind of exhibit them, um, some of them, we thought that it would be nice to tell you a story that shows, that surfaces some of the tensions that we're seeing in this current system. 
uh, the current course evaluation process. So it's the start of a new semester and Professor Pat is teaching a new experimental class called Engineering 101 and everyone's really excited for the class. Um, throughout the semester, students generally like the class and provide a lot of positive feedback, whether that's directly to, the prof to Professor Pat verbally, uh, through mid-semester course feedback forms, just all the different feedback channels throughout the semester, students are providing positive feedback. However, at the end of the semester, things are starting to get a little rough. The final project, specifically, is a little rough on the edges, and Sam, in particular, is a little frustrated. Maybe they don't feel like they're adequately supported, maybe they don't like how the project is structured. Either way, student Sam is frustrated. When the semester ends, the final project is what's on student Sam's mind when they fill out the course evaluations. And so in their course evaluations, they mostly talk about uh, the, the kind of the final project, which was a little rough, neglecting how most of the, uh, the semester went pretty positively. At home, Professor Pat reads the course evaluations and feels that they're a little incomplete. They feel that overall the semester went pretty well, and a lot of the feedback they were getting was just the feedback on the uh, final project. Finally, at the end of the school, uh, the academic year, uh, administrators such as the faculty use the course evaluations to uh, in Professor Pat's annual reviews. So, now that the semester has ended, how did course evaluations leave all of our stakeholders feeling? Um, the dean of faculty, uh, to start with. Is a little, knowing that the course evaluations are incomplete is wary to base their evaluations on these course evaluations. Professor Pat is a little disappointed that they didn't get more complete feedback on the whole course or its direction, and that the, uh, that the feedback was just focused on the final project. They're also anxious that their supervisor only sees a, an incomplete picture of how the class ran. Finally, the students um, uh, feel accomplished that they have participated in this cool new experimental co-design process at Olin, but they're also a little worried that, that their feedback won't be uh, completely accounted for, whatever that means. So this is just one story, um, and we kind of wanted to share the wide variety of kind of stakeholder feelings that we came across during our investigation. Um, so from the student perspective, we kind of came across that most students feel that course evaluations are kind of a civic duty, um, and those course evaluations come along with a lot of the like kind of feelings of obligation and tiringness that civic duty also sometimes comes along with. Um, so students kind of find this a bit as an outlet, but also a bit tiring at the end of a semester. Um, from the faculty point of view, one of the major things that we heard is that course evaluations are often predictable. Um, faculty are often soliciting feedback in their courses in a multitude of ways, whether that's one-on-one -on -one conversations, feedback forums, or other methods. So they already have an idea of how their course is going from the student perspective. Based on this, a lot of um, faculty feel like their course evaluation doesn't diverge as much from their course value, from their like feedback observations. Beyond this, we did note that some of the feedback from some of the course evaluations do have negative impacts. So a lot of faculty felt that they were worried that their course evaluations might be impacted by their identity um, and that students were um, unknowingly taking that into account and impacting that bias into their course evals. Um, on some counts, we heard that course evaluations can just be harmful. Um, some of the comments in them are personal attacks against faculty um, and can leave the faculty with a really negative feeling about themselves. Um, on the positive side, we did hear that there's often actionable feedback in course evaluations. So this isn't true for everyone that there's harm in course evaluations. There's also good things. Um, faculty can kind of learn things about their course that they might not have heard in other methods um, and can take that feedback to make change. From the admin perspective, the main idea that we heard was that course evaluations are necessary from, some, from this perspective. We need some way to evaluate courses and also figure out how they're doing so we can better support faculty as well as evaluate them. Um, but beyond this, we also heard that course evaluations can be pretty binary. You don't really get a lot of information beyond the course is really going well or it might not be, um, but there's not a lot of granularity to that feedback. So why aren't course evals working? We kind of came to, to one thing that, that we kept coming back to here. Um, and that is that course evals have too many goals. From Professor Pat's perspective, you know, we want course evals to improve the experience of being in the course. We want it to enable them to understand the, the, the role that their course is playing in the curriculum. We want it to help them develop their identity and sense of self and have some kind of communication and feedback from students. For the dean of faculty, they want feedback to evaluate performance for reappointment and promotion, 
as well as to help faculty develop as teachers. Students want to reflect on their experience. Sometimes this is venting about their frustrations with the course, where others it's articulating constructive criticism of the course. Sometimes it's direct feedback to the faculty member. Cool, so if we think about kind of how all of those goals fit into the system of course evaluations and where the information is flowing, there's kind of this ideal where you have a whole bunch of student input that feeds into one centralized system that is course evaluations, and from that you can kind of funnel out into all of those different goals. So you can get course improvement data, you can get faculty evaluation and improvement data, you can get uh, all of those things that, the, uh, that all of our stakeholders wanted. Um, but what's actually happening is you're not able to widen that funnel effectively. What happens is you have a whole bunch of information going into one centralized system and all you can really get out of it is a weak signal of are things going okay or are they not. You can't really get any more without additional context um, despite the huge amount of data that's going into these course evaluations. Um, and as a team, we kind of grappled with this for a long time and uh, it came to this metaphor that we helped, that helped us kind of make sense of this, is that course evaluations are kind of like making a cake to eat an egg. So let's say I <laughs> wanted to eat an egg and I decided, okay, great, I'm gonna eat an egg. How am I gonna go, go about doing that? I'm gonna take the egg and nine, nine other ingredients and mix them all together and then put that into the oven and then out comes a cake. And then I, had, I put 10 things in there, I cut the cake into 10 slices, I eat one of them and it's not an egg. I can tell that there's an egg maybe in there, I can like tell that it's there, but I'm really not getting what I want out of that because there's so many other things happening. And that's kind of exactly what's happening in course evaluations. Someone in this world where you can only make a cake might want a cup of flour out of their cake, whereas I want an egg, or someone else with a teaspoon of vanilla extract, in the same way that everyone wants something different out of course evaluations. But when they all get mixed together, all you can really get is a weak signal that there's something there. Um, so that kind of gets at the fundamental question that we landed on and we thought we were going to answer in this semester of work and realized it's a lot more <laughs> than a semester of work and that is how does Olin get the right feedback to the right people? Um, and that is a really big question. It goes beyond just course evaluations because you kind of have to outline what is the right feedback and who needs to get it. Uh, and that feeds into all sorts of things. There's a definition of learning that you have to consider and the fact that there's lots of them. Um, there's faculty goals, student perspectives, the larger goals and plans of Olin, um, as well as what feedback mechanisms currently exist. So we uh, spent a lot of time with course evaluations and really learned that it's a, it's a really complex space trying to do a lot of things. Um, and we're excited to kind of continue to explore, see where, see where this goes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take any questions or any comments you guys have. And I know our presentation, I think, I, I can probably only use so half of our 20 minutes. We're hoping, yeah, we're hoping to kind of have discussions. Yeah. Discussions. yeah. Um, I know there's dozens, if not hundreds, of studies on course evaluations that show that, you know, they don't necessarily, in those studies, the results of those studies are that they don't show whether the course is good or bad. They only reflect on the identity of the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's something that you listed as a concern, but I wonder, if, did you consult those studies? Um, how would you respond to them that they're just a bias metric that solely reflects on the identity of the instructor? Yeah, um, sure. So I think that's something that we definitely uh, thought about. We ended up learning that um, kind of a similar quantitative analysis of the kind of the Likert scale part of course evaluations was done at Olin and showed that there wasn't kind of a, a difference based on identity, which obviously isn't the whole picture, and I think that what we kind of wanted to explore from there is how does that impact how people think about their course evaluations, um, because it does, have, it does have an impact on how people think about their course evaluations, regardless of if the, if the effect actually exists at Olin. I think one of the things was also, I think we, from talking to individual faculty, we had heard that this was a concern that many faculty had, that this is maybe an experience that they had, um, and so I think, at the very least, I think we were, and 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 I think we got a qual like some qualitative, like this seems to generally be true across the board. And so I think, given this project was on a short timeline, we didn't do a kind of round of literature review, um, and we just accepted that this is generally generally what will happen in course evaluations. Um, and I think we went further. Well, it's just, yeah. yeah, yeah. I my memory is that there was analysis done a couple years ago about Olin, course evals in particular, 
um, and there wasn't a, like a quantitative difference shown between male and female faculty members um, at Olin, like there is at most other institutions. But the qualitative comments. But the qualitative us. comments are a lot harder to analyze because it's so much data. Um, so, so it's totally, we think it's very likely that gender is playing into the qualitative responses, but um, there wasn't any difference in the quantitative. 